this question. I want to get your opinion on this. Do you think that segregation, desegregation rather, do you think that it was a benefit or a detriment to us as a whole? It's a very nuanced question, as with anything in this fucking country. I think that there were positives and there were negatives. I think I was saying earlier on this on this live that as long as we're living on white man's land, segregation was never going to be wholly positive because at the end of the day, they could fuck shit whenever they're ready. I.e. Oklahoma. Yeah, like Tulsa. Black Wall right. Street. You know what I'm saying? Like Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Philadelphia, you know, and a number of other places we can build these flourishing communities with nothing, but they still have the ability to come and mold it over. So I think that there was a, the positive part of segregation was that in our inability to integrate in these other spaces, we made our own um, standards of greatness and our, we had our own, and our dollar stayed in our community. And we were, for what it's worth, forced to rely on each other. So by nature of simply just not having access, we created our own process. Once desegregation happened, I think the biggest, the biggest thing that I look at the negative desegregation is it somehow made white right. It made being able to have access to whiteness as the highest level of success and that's in and that's like white jobs white people like white women like white um white skin right there was a lot of passing going on like all of that shit is at its root about like the brainwashing working to make us hate ourselves because what really should have happened when desegregation took place because we should still stay in our community, but just reap the benefits of separate being equal. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's really what you know, and that's what Jews have done. Jews are like, we're gonna take all the resources be over here, right? And we're gonna funnel it into our community and make this tribe continue to work amongst itself. And you know, there, but, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to look at us on. I'm not looking down on our ancestors with disdain. You know, the, the system, the the teaching was just effective. Right. I mean, I I look at it and, and I think I think back to, I did like this thing on reconstruction when I was in school, the reconstruction era, and just how much black people were able to accomplish and the positions we were able to hold during reconstruction and all the things that we were able to do during reconstruction and how that was you know, how the movies and everything that was put out, the you know what I mean, it, it, uh, basically the propaganda that was put out to make black people, I, I can't think of the name of the movie right now, but it's a classic movie, the probably the most racist movie ever made, the black and white movie where they had black people in the comments. Oh, uh, Brain um, we both having one. Uh, come on, boom. Birth of a Nation, Birth there we go. Nation. That, and if you watch that movie now, the propaganda that's being shown in that movie hasn't changed at all because right after Ahmaud Arbery situation came, then you start seeing all of these videos come out of him getting arrested for shit and him getting, you know, antagonized by the police for things. And it's the same method that's being used now as it was then. So you could just see that their methods haven't changed. So if their methods haven't changed, then all we have to do is adjust and be able to make ourselves utilize the power that we have to null and void that shit. But it's so hard because, you know, niggas, man. You know what I mean? We, That's really <laughs> we, That's we, we, It's tough, man. Niggas is just... I love niggas. I'm a nigga. I'd say it proudly, but it's just... We just... Shit. You know what I mean? It it's works. Tough. It takes... It, it, it really... It really is a, um, we have a very nihilistic existence. It's just a lot of like hatred and self-hatred. And, you know, I can't say it enough. Like the shit worked. Like the Willie Lynch syndrome, like all that shit has been wildly effective. But right, I agree. I, and I believe. Know, like we just talk and we just talk and we not doing. But I don't, I don't agree with that because I think if we, if we're going to look at, 
like the trends in history, right? Like we are in this, we're in a time right now where we're building up to another, there's gonna be another revolution. Like that's gonna happen. And in order for that to happen, it starts with a lot of talking. It starts with ideology, it starts with philosophy, it starts with reimagining identity. And all of that starts with first talking. And to be honest, even talking becomes revolution for a lot of people because a lot of folks don't think can talk about these things publicly. They don't feel right. like- Right, it used to be illegal have... for us to do this, like to, for us to stand and build Hell and yeah. talk to each other. It used to be yeah, illegal. People like... are still even on here saying like, do you think talking is gonna ruin your career? So like, there's still like this mindset of like, you can't say too much or else. or else. So we have to start the talking. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I just you know that's why I'd be on y'all Yeah, I mean, hey, shit. At some point, you got to realize that the, the change that you, you know, you people always, I forget who it was that said the quote, you know, live the change that you hope to see. Fine. But, you know, me coming from, you know, I'm from D.C., D.C. public schools the whole way through, one of the worst schooling systems, father murdered, all my, most of my male influences was in the street. My mother didn't graduate from high school. I got every excuse to use the, to be, you know, to blame somebody else. But the reality is responsibility is one of the biggest things that we lack. Like, especially for black men, niggas is just don't want to accept the responsibility of being a man. And the thing, and we have a skewed uh, misconception of what it means what to be that? a man. Huh? That's what I was gonna, so can you speak to that? Yes, to me, well, this is the mind you, in my opinion, a lot of the things that we assume makes you a man is bullshit. Like being tough and being a gangster and all that shit. That's that doesn't make you a man. Like not subscribing to youthful ignorance makes you a man. Accepting responsibility makes you a man. You know what I mean? Taking care of your people and, and being able to, to stand firm on what you believe in, no matter what it may be, that makes you a man. But manhood is so it's like it's attached to age, but there are a lot of guys who are old but still haven't reached manhood yet because they haven't been able to accept the responsibility of what it takes to be a man the reality is don't nobody give a fuck about being if you a man nobody give a fuck about you and you got to be willing to especially a black man the only ones that really care about us is y'all for real do you know what i mean so at the end of the day you got to accept the fact that when you're a black man out here it's going to come a lot of you won't have to do a lot of things without any reward you're not going to get any rewards. You're not going to get any pats on the back. But you got to accept that. And a lot of us have been babied and protected from the realities of things so much that our manhood has been sheltered and has been watered down. So by the time you become a man, you, you're, you're no use to your community because you done already fucked your name up. You ain't got no credit. You ain't got, you're a felon. You can't go do nothing when you come home. So it's like we just get so lost in what manhood is because a lot of the men that have come from our communities have been stripped away from. Like I personally think crack cocaine killed what was left of the black community because it got us both ways. Either you were selling it, you were smoking it, yeah. or you was in the communities that it was being sold and smoked in. And I just know that how it affected me growing up in DC in the 90s, I saw how it affected my community. I saw how it affected my mind. If it wasn't for my uncle getting murdered in 2002, I probably wouldn't have accepted being a man when I did, because if him being murdered in the way that he did, let me know the realities of what it was for me, because he was a hundred times tougher than I ever could be. But for him to go out the way he did, I was like, oh shit, this nigga's 33 years old and got murdered on the streets doing the same things he was doing when he was 17. And for what, you know what I mean? For what, for what reason? What, do you, what, did, what came from that but a whole bunch of pain and a whole bunch of nothingness and so many of us go through that and then the fucked up part is if we don't accept being a man when we if we do make it out you can still end up with a knee on your neck and going out like that so you gotta accept the responsibilities that come with being a man and be willing to die about whatever it is you believe in and until we get a unified front for black men that are willing to die about whatever it is we say we want to do then we lost out here in my opinion I think there's one missing part to that equation. Feelings. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I don't know nobody that's really willing to die for something they don't have strong feelings about. Like, like, niggas got stronger feelings about money than about themselves. 
Yeah, because that's what we attach our self worth to is having yeah. something because of what comes with I having money. Niggas like, I see niggas say like, yeah, like I gotta go sit in the. Fe I may have to go sit down in the fest for thirty five, but I made a meal, and I'm like, but you don't even get to spend the meal. Your family doesn't get to spend the meal. So what was the point of the meal? But I made it though. I made right. it. But you right. see that they tricked you. They tricked you into thinking that making their money made you. Right. And it does because now you get to go sit in their motherfucking jail. For and now you're making sense a day for them to floss on in San Tropez. That's right. And the, the crazy thing is my, my auntie, uh, God rest her soul, moved into a house in, in Uptown B and the house was like probably about fifty six thousand dollars three level like a uh, brownstone style houses that they have in northwest dc i went home mm -hmm. last year and went to my old neighborhood just to walk through or whatever and then there the, the, was some white people because mind you my the whole side of town that i come from has been gentrified all the way so oh, wow. i had the lady happen to be outside and i asked her i was like you know i used to live in this house i you know grew up in this house how much did this house sell for and she was oh we got it for 1.9 I was like, God damn. And all this money that came through my house out the street, not, nobody thought to take any of that and buy none of this property. We Like the mentality is just, is fucked up, man. And and I come from, but I, but you when know what I was like talking real, about, so. When I was talking about feelings, I just think a lot of brothers just, the trauma that, that so many folks are experiencing is preventing them from being able to deal with their feelings. And so that ends up causing a myriad of behaviors that get in the way of actually being able to quote unquote be a man in the way that you're talking about because if you can't get in touch with yourself in that way then how are you going to truly be able to overcome a, a, a patriarchal system yeah. that has told you from day one no how a man is like no like it takes a certain level of courage of gumption like to be able to like as a as a as an individual say, I think there's a different way, you know? And like, that to me is the, like as a black woman, as black men, like that's the biggest thing for me is like wanting to see brothers realize that like the, the time they're buying in is the same system of the oppression that's trying to take them out. The and I think, that, I'm gonna tell you why I think that is, is because that's all we have. All we have is our own, the only thing that it can be taking, taken away from us without full, I mean, is, is our masculinity, is our manhood, you know, like kind of like that saying, your balls and your word, that's all we have. That's all we have to stand on. A lot of the guys that come from the communities that I grew up in for a long time, I thought the only thing you could be was tough or not be a sucker or not express your feelings, like you said, because if you express feelings, that means you are, you are succumbing to the pressures you're of weak. the world. You're a weak nigga, you a sucker, you know what I mean? And, and, if you if we lose that, then we really have been stripped of everything because it's nothing else that we have. Like that shit, I can say now that it broke my heart. That it breaks my heart every time I go home to DC. And I'm from uptown, 14th and U Street, and all these places where I used to play when I was a little boy. And 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 to see white people walking dogs I've never seen before, and 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 you know these apartment buildings that they knock down the projects and build up and now it's three thousand four thousand dollars a month for a studio apartment and none of us are there like that hurts me but the reality is how do you even express that without seeming like oh man you bitch ass nigga you fuck is you worry about that shit for because we just don't have no outlet there is no place for us as black men that, that i know of at least to where we can express ourselves and get it out and then go back and face the world with that, without that stress and strain on us. There's nowhere to release it because if you release it, that means you letting go of the one thing that we have that can't be taken away from us. And that's our manhood because our manhood is all that we really have to stand on in a lot of cases. Like a lot of dudes, like you said, that'll make that million dollars and go sit down for 35 years. The reason why they'll do that is because I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm tough. I'm a man, I can go sit down for 35 years and not cry because that's I got that to stand on. I have that to be able, I have my manhood to be able to build up, you know, uh, my people that's out in the streets. My son that might never ever see me again, I can pass this on to him. I can pass my masculinity down to him. Your daddy was, your daddy stood tall. I stood tall in the situation. I ain't telling nobody. I, and, and, and that's the code and that's the way it's supposed to be. But at the end of the day, that's all he has to pass down. My father 
didn't have a headstone on his grave. And that means that whatever had happened up into his life, he hadn't garnered enough monetary assets to be able to put a marker down to let the world know he existed, nor did anyone around him have enough capital to be able to do it. So all he passed down was me. And if I wasn't smart enough to be able to maneuver around the chaos that we got to deal with, then that's all I would have. Like, shit, I got to turn up because my nigga was, you know, somebody killed my father. Now I'm, I'm walking the earth, so I got to be tough. And I had that mentality for a long time, but then I realized that the reality is I shouldn't go out like a patch of grass. There's so many of us that go out as patches of grass, and that's all we leave is the grass that our bodies was buried in. We don't leave anything here for our people to be able to grab onto and say, my father did this. He left this for me. He put this on earth so I wouldn't have to go through the same struggles that he went through and wouldn't have to conceal those same feelings that he went through. We don't have that, man. It's, 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 it's tough out here. It's tough out here. To change. We have to, so much of like, so much of the stuff that, that simply just takes place within the black community and the way we react to things is gonna come down to us changing our definition of things and changing the way that we, changing the things that we respond to, changing the way that, the things that we reward. And, you know, there's a lot of women in here who are mothers and there's fathers in here. And it's like, you know, even just like the affection that we show our children, the way we speak to our children, the, the way that we deal with their, um, you know, the way that we deal with their, their fears and their frustrations and their emotions we are so we use such violent language on such a basis that makes you afraid to, that makes you afraid to feel if you cry and says quit fucking crying you have now associated crying with with a word that is also just very violent so like yeah. you, don't, you don't feel safe crying and you, you gonna need to cry Right, and that's the way I was raised. You know, I love my mother I know. to death, and that's my nigga now. But when I was young, she was like, I can't teach you how to be no, she used to say this to me all the time, man, I can't teach you how to be no man, but you damn sure ain't gonna be no bitch. Like, that's what she would say to me. And, I, and I'm and i thankful for it. I was raised in the same bullshit, because that's the thing. We're all right. in the same fuck shit. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely you know what right. I'm saying? And, like, our mom and, I, and I can't say that she's wrong because, and I can say this publicly now, that's the reason why I have kind of like a, I've always had a fear of having a son because I only know how to implement the things that I know how to do from a certain perspective. I, I don't have the reference point of my father because he was dead and all of my uncles was tough guys and they gave me lessons directly. And my mother was like, nigga. But, but Chico, that's not true. I mean, you I do have I, reference I, points. I mean, but I know now points of what not to do. Right, but how to implement those though kind of it's like it's but scary that's to me. where the that's where the communing has to happen. Like you're not I guess what I'm saying is like we have to create spaces where those conversations happen. Like we have to make it earn make an earnest effort to like talk to each other and ask those questions. A lot of times we don't and a lot of times we don't even understand that like if you did ask that question someone would be completely willing to have an answer and like talk it out. But it's the shame of not knowing that a lot of times stops us from having that, that conversation or the, or the embarrassment, not shame, but more so like, I feel like just the embarrassment or the consternation of feeling like I should know. None of us fucking know. None of us, we don't know. Like I'm literally in therapy right now having all these guys breakthroughs because I'm realizing like, Oh, like there's just certain shit I just didn't know. None of us know how to be in a fucking relationship. Mm. Like how? From what what example? Where? Yeah. So, to define that and like that take talking through it. Like I see people in here like asking like, what is y'all call to action? The, the call to action is we're literally having a conversation. A man, a black man and a black man are having a conversation about a myriad of topics that we're either gonna agree or just on, but we're doing it in a respectful fashion. We're learning perspectives from each other. That's the call to action. <laughs> this is black love. That's what right. it's Yeah, and I'm with it. Like, I love this type of shit because, you know, it's, it's setting an example that we can communicate with each other without beefing, you know what I mean? Because a lot of what we see and a lot of the examples that we see of ourselves, we always at each other's throat about nonsense. But, you know, I just think that 
at this point for all of the shit that's going on. And mind you, that's the backdrop of a world pandemic that's going on. That is a whole nother fucking, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We almost like, forgot about that shit. Yeah, I know. That's the, that, that lets you know how crazy the world is. Like, we went from, like, I was just telling somebody the other day in February, if you walk into a store with a mask and gloves on, you were a criminal. Now, if you don't have on mask and gloves, you're a criminal. So the world has shifted that quickly in a couple of months. But all of the things that have been going on in the same, in the old world are still happening in front of us. But outside is completely different. Like, we know we are live performers. I don't even want to think about how much money you... It, it, we, I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It hurt. It hurt, dog. The man. Ah! See, that's another thing we got to talk about. We got to get to the point where we start to express that shit. Because after a while, it's going to be like, man, fuck. Like, what's I've going really on, just, I've been just like, <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> it's nasty. It's nasty, man. And it's, you know, the best thing for me in this time that I've gotten out of the quarantine or just the world being shut down is that I've learned how to be a better father to my daughter because she takes the biggest L in regards to me always being on the road and being gone. And I try to compensate for it with the things that I do for her, but there's nothing like that giving her that reference point that I was just talking about, why she laughs at the things she laughs at or why she thinks the way she thinks. Like, I take pride in being able to give her those examples because I never had them. But at the same time, I just look at the world the way that it, the way that it was and the way that we subscribe to so much, thinking that that's what you were supposed to do just to have it taken away from you like that. So it's like, well, well am I supposed to still subscribe to the same things whenever it goes back to whatever it's going to be or do I change my whole mentality about what I'm supposed to dedicate my energy and, and my, my time to out here. You're supposed to change your whole mentality. But th th that's the thing. How? How do you change? Like, that's another question that I think a lot of people are going to need to be answered because, like, you spent your whole life up until February 2020 thinking that this is the way to do things to be able to better your existence. And then March came and whoop, everything's out of there. So, when you go back, whenever it goes open, because there's no such thing as going back to what it was then. So whenever it does open back up, the re like the, the restructuring of the mind has to be, you have to be very, very keen in doing so. But how can we do it when everything that we're seeing out here is the same as it always has been in regards to the fucked up aspects of the world? Like, how do you break that cycle? How do you make yourself think differently when everything around you is the same? in a negative aspect. I think part of it is is changing your practices. Like, I know a lot of us who be on the road and, you know, who are hardworking, like that kind of becomes our spirituality. Like that becomes our mantra. Like just, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta keep moving. I gotta keep doing what I gotta do. Like that also becomes the foundation of our, right? Like I am a performer. I am working, I am providing. I made place. it, you I know what I mean? It. Right. This is why I'm here in the world. And I think what, what ends up shifting is what you're anchored to. And it doesn't mean that when the shit comes back that you don't go back to performing, you don't go back to providing. And you don't yeah, you have to. But, but what that's anchored to is the part that has to shift right now. And, you know, what is your ambition? What is the means to the end of your, what, what is your, like, means to an end? Like, if right. it, is it for celebrity? Is it for getting a show? I know so many people that are doing everything they're doing just so they can get their own show. That was it, to get your own that, show. Well, right. newsflash, that's empty. That's an empty goal. <laughs> right. Because my, my happening always different. Like so I what always... ends up happening is you end up having to reassign your your goals and ambitions to values. Right. And I agree. Values can exist in many different things. So getting a show, I'm not saying that that can't be a desire. I'm not saying that that can't be a win, but that can't be the driving force. The end all be all. Right. I and always, I know many I never, people I never that really that's had those. 
I think that helps me a little bit too, Amanda, because I never really had the same goals and aspirations in this industry as most people. Because like I said, my motivation came from a different place. I was just trying not to be a patch of grass. Like I, I didn't beat the game already from, you know, my existence and where I come from. I'm not going. I'm not going to let you be. A I'm not going out like that. Like I, I didn't already beat the game, but as far as, you know, what to aspire to do for most people. Now I'm not really speaking for my own self because you know I'm, I'm. If I don't know, I'm. I'm willing to say that I don't know. So I'm. I'm very easy. I'm not that my ego don't work like. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know everything. I, I'm very, very teachable. But for most people, I just think that for people who haven't established what they want to do with themselves, it's going to be so hard to, for them to be able to go back out into a world where everything is shifted and they don't have any idealism of what it is they're supposed to be striving to do anymore. I think that's going to cause a lot of people to, to be just lost out here whenever shit do go back out to the right way because everything that you subscribe to has changed. We was, I was having a conversation the other day and just thinking about how many hands we've shaken in the past three, four years, how many pictures and how many meet and greets and all of those things that can't be the same the way the world has shifted now, where sneezing a cough is the new, is weapons. Now, you can go to jail for that shit now. Like, you literally can go to jail for coughing on a motherfucker. Right. So how do you, how do you find the same, for, the people, for a lot of people, how are they going to get that same... Um, uh, just validation that they've been getting from those type of things. And I've been trying to think of ways to just explain to people, because luckily for me, I've never subscribed to needing any of that. Right. But for those who do, it's going to be tough because you're not going to be able to get it the same way anymore. It's, it's impossible to be able to get it the same way, at least not for the foreseeable future. I mean, with Smart Bunny and Black, we did a virtual show and we were able to do like meet and greet we were able to um, provide like a networking space where people could literally like have like live moments like this with random people in the venue, in the venue. Um, right. <laughs> it's crazy. You know? it, it, no, you're right. It's trippy. Like it's trippy in the mug, but we adapt. Right. Because I think you know, about I mean, how fun the small, funny black way. shows we did was. This shit was fucking fun. Like just seeing the energy of the people and being able to, feel the, you know, the, the, the way that people react to the things that we are able to bring to the world is like, how do, how do you shift that? How do you get to a point where now, because people always say when it goes back to normal, but I, I think it's just optimism that people are holding on to, but there's a, just a greater chance that it never does than it will. You know what I mean? It's just the greater of a chance that you'll never be able to be in an arena with thousands of people than it is that you will be able to again, because there is no real answer. There's no outcome that we have to be able to, there's no end to it. We don't have any end goal, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's it's, it's just a weird time, Amanda Seals. It's a weird ass time. <laughs> it's a weird, it's a weird time. It's a dark time. Um, I try and find the positives. I mean, I'm very fortunate that I'm a very um, adaptable person. Like, I'm good at a pivot. So, I'm, are we doing this now? All yeah. Right. And I, I'm looking at some of the comments, man. See, this is what I mean about niggas. Somebody just commented, y'all talking about killing white people or nah. Get your good, listen, man. People, niggas that I'm want talking attention. about white supremacy. I'm always talking about that. Of course. But the thing about it is people just think that whatever they saw is the thing to talk about. Like, but people, you, are first also... of all, you would, people don't even understand what that means. I come from an environment where killing was abundant. Right. Like, stop playing. You don't have the, the, the stomach the to even get police remotely police close to doing that. Huh? Someone said the Minnesota police precinct is on fire. Oh, I, they burnt a couple of them down. Good. Yeah, they, they burnt a couple of those down. They they going up in Minnesota, and it's a lot of black people in Minnesota. We learned that on the 85 South. We went, when we did Minnesota, we was like, whoa. Where the oh, fuck yeah, it's not, it's not Bobby's World doing shit. Oh, home. no, 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 no. Minnesota is full of black people, and it's like, and it makes you think it got to be a little bit more of us than they let Noah Carlos say that all the time. There's more niggas than they telling us out here. Because everywhere they you go, they talk about eight percent. I'm like, not the way we fucking. 
<laughs> Raw too. Like, you know what I mean? I got we got we like to feel it. You're right. <laughs> Straight through. We like I to that, feel it. I said that on goddamn real. They were like, Amanda, are are you gonna have kids? I'm like, you know what? I'm so tired of condoms. So Yeah, just just, just, just after a certain age, you get sick of that shit. It's like, look. I do not want to put this filter on my dick, ma'am. Please. <laughs> so I, I just like I'm only fucking if you my man, because I really don't want to be <laughs> right. I, we had to I'm get done. Fuck, my pussy practicing. is like we're good. We're good. My pussy is like we're good. We'll just we'll just we rather not. If we can. <laughs> yeah. We rather not you. if we can. If we can, but I feel you. I um I have an episode of my podcast, Small Doses side effects of fatherhood and our band leader from smart funny and black dw he was the host and i think you would actually benefit from listening to it um okay because he just i i just didn't anticipate like where he was coming like he just it was a really dope episode that i learned so much about just fatherhood you know and and um and parenting and i think that we just have to share notes. We just have to compare notes. <laughs> you know, it, that's really what it is. It's really, honestly, Chico, it's not any, and to everyone listening, it's not really that much more, um, that much more complicated than, we have to start sharing notes about like everything. Like my mom always tells me like, your generation is different because y'all actually talk. And she always says that like, you know, my mom is born in 47. She always says that her generation they never talked about things that were wrong. Never. So there was a whole lot of parents that raised us without any insight from anybody else. Right. Without any knowledge base on how to do it. Because my mother definitely didn't have her father. And, you know, what I mean, and I, my family is very different. We They was off the chain. So I'm blessed. And now it's crazy because now my mother is able to do all of the things that she didn't do with me with my daughter and that's beautiful because now she feels like all the things that she went through with me worked so now she can be free and just be all loving and not have that 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 hardness that she had with me because I started working when I was nine years old my mother told me look I'm responsible for what you need I can give a fuck about what you want what you want is on you so I've been getting what I want on my own very long but now my daughter, she doesn't know the lady that raised me. And I'm happy about that. A lot of people be like, who is that lady? I'm like, I, I'm glad that she got to let, let that part of her out because that was always in her. But with me, man, you know, my little brother and, you know, my little brother was a little easier because I was already outside. But and already you know cracked. I mean? yeah. Like now she's able to do those things. But now with me being a father to a little girl, especially, it's like I have a responsibility to make sure, like, I, my biggest thing with my daughter is teaching her what she doesn't, making sure she knows what she doesn't want. Because what you want, you really don't have to put any effort into that. The things you like can come and go as often as they want to. But the things you don't like are the things that you hate in your life. Shit that you don't fuck with, you want to deal with that as least as possible. And I feel like teaching her how to be as forward about her own emotions and being okay with being who she is without fear of criticism or ridicule is so important now because she got a different world to grow up in than I did. Wasn't no social media. Right. I only knew what, right. I only knew what the girls looked like in my neighborhood and in the surrounding areas. And I, I didn't have nobody telling me that I was ugly or telling me that my shoes weren't cool or none of that shit unless you said it to me in my face and we were able to deal with that accordingly. Now we don't live in that type of world. So I think that one of the most important things to me as a father is making sure that she's accepting of who she is. My theory is as long as you're not knowingly hurting yourself or anybody else, then you're good. I don't give a fuck what she want to do. If she want to be a rodeo clown, I want her to be as confident as possible in that because now she's growing up in a world where opinion drives so much more than it's ever driven before. And now you can give your opinion, as we can see in the comments, publicly and privately at the same time. You can say, fuck Amanda Seals and Chico B with a, 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 not even a picture of you on the little circle. Right. When I click on your profile, you have zero pictures following zero pe people are following you and you following 5,000 motherfuckers. 
And then it's like, we don't even know if these are real people. This could be a computer system that's just set up to throw salt in the game. So it's like, how do you navigate that as a child? Because influence is, is everything to these kids. Like my daughter doesn't watch TV. She watches her phone on the TV. You know what I mean? And I had to show her all of these different things. Like that's the cool part of quarantine. My daughter didn't know who James Brown was who Richard Pryor was, who uh, uh, Little Richard was. She didn't know who any of these people were. So we sat down in my basement and I just ran YouTube videos just to give her the, the, the reference yeah. points that nobody, you know, that she wouldn't give a fuck about learning because now TikTok is the shit. That's all she care about is doing this shit. So it's like, it's just a different time, man. Yeah, all that doing, that's important to kids. And I can't necessarily say it's wrong because, you know, when I was young, when we were young, the shit that we wanted to subscribe to, I wanted to be on Guts, bad as a motherfucker. Bad as a motherfucker. I, I wanted to be on Guts so bad. I, I, I was, was watching, every time yeah, I watched it, I, I know I could murder it. I know. Legends I of the Hidden you Temple know what I was and all watching? that shit. I was watching Legends of the Hidden Temple. That's what Man, I was watching. Listen, they need to bring that back for like us. We need to work on get that show back for grown people. So we could just live our childhood dreams. Actually, <laughs> the same, the same band leader, uh, doing D Dub. That's our our band leader for the clapbacks. It's not in black. He was on Carmen San Diego. Word. Yes. Oh, I had man, no that idea. Is a this is was a fucking child genius. For real. He got into like Rutgers or some shit when he was like nine or some crazy. I'm like, nigga, what? Exactly. And I used that smartphone in black. Like, exactly. All that shit. I seen somebody put double dead in there. Man, what? Double, all of, that's what I was. Is it 